Hi, I'm Ruben Saltzman with Structure Tech Home Inspections. Today's topic is ice dams. I'm going to cover everything about ice dams. I'm going to talk about what causes ice dams, what it takes to prevent them, what it doesn't take to prevent them. I'm going to cover a bunch of myths that people like to cover about ice dams. And finally, we're going to talk about what to do if you already have them. All right, so to start off, exactly what is an ice dam? Well, I've got a great diagram that I'd like to share with you. This is from a good buddy of mine, Steve Cool, over at the ice dam company. He put this together showing how an ice dam works. So ice dams typically occur when you have a lot of snow on a roof and you have overnight temperatures in the 15 to 25 degree range. That's kind of the sweet spot for ice dams. Not the only time it happens, but that's, that's the best time and especially when you have a lot of snow on the roof. And what ends up happening is you have heat getting from the interior of the home to the roof surface. It ends up melting that snow, and then the melt water runs down to the edge of the eave where we don't have any more heat, and it freezes again. As that process continues over and over again, you end up having ice that builds up at the edge of the roof, and eventually water can get trapped between the ice and the shingles, and as it goes farther and farther up the roof, eventually water can leak through. Now, I know some people will say, well, you need ice and water shield and that'll help prevent leaks. That's right, it'll help prevent leaks. It will not prevent leaks. Ice and water shield is only a first line of defense. It doesn't prevent leaks. So when you're looking at an ice dam from the outside, if you see icicles forming at the edge of a roof, you don't necessarily have an ice dam. Those icicles, that, that can happen on an unheated garage. You can have icicles showing up at the edge. So it, I, icicles coming over the edge isn't necessarily a problem, but if you see icicles coming out between the fascia and your soffit, that little intersection there, especially these nasty little brown icicles, that is a telltale sign that you've had water leaking in, typically through an ice dam. That's, that's bad news. And it, what turns the water brown is tannins in the wood. It's after, after the water travels through the wood, it stains it, and then you get brown icicles. Bad news. So you, you don't ever want to see those. What's worse is when you have icicles coming out of your soffit. Now that's, that's especially bad news. You see that, you have a problem, you need to fix it. You've had water leaking through. If you've got water dripping out of your soffit during melt days, ouch. That's, that's really bad news. You don't ever want to see stuff like this. If you have ice coming down the side of your house, you've got big problems. If you have water coming through your ceiling, that's the point at which people usually take action and people actually do something about it. So I, I know it's crazy that people wait this long, but that's reality. So what it really all comes down to is attic bypasses. Insulation also plays a role, so I've included it here. And what barely plays any role at all, it, it hardly makes any difference, believe it or not, is going to be ventilation. Now, I, I'm not saying it doesn't make a difference, but it, it's not nearly as important as these two other factors. And that's why I have the text really small here, just to make, make sure we get the right relationship there. And as long as I'm going to talk about attic bypasses, if, if you have an attic where there's any type of problems with moisture in the attic, such as frost, condensation, mold growing in the attic, delaminated roof sheathing, any of these types of issues, this is all caused by attic bypasses as well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about bypasses, but th that's a fix for all this other stuff. So attic bypasses don't just cause ice dams, they cause a lot of different attic problems. And I, I love this image because if you have people saying, well, you need more attic ventilation, that's, that's what's causing your problems. Now, boy, it's, it's a little bit like saying you're bleeding because you don't have a Band-Aid on your finger. You're, you're going after the symptoms. You're bleeding because you're cut. Uh, you, you have attic problems because you have moisture getting up there, not because you don't have ways of getting rid of the moisture. And, you know, in, in this photo, we've got the roof vent here and you see there's a tiny little area where we don't have mold growing, what would the solution be if somebody says you need to fix this with more ventilation? Just like, you know, put in a hundred roof vents? I don't know. I like that image. So exactly what is an attic bypass? 
It's, it's a passageway for warm, moist air to get in the attic. And here's a nice image illustrating that. This is the most notorious spot for attic bypasses. It's the vent for the furnace and water heater on older homes. It's going to go down from the basement all the way up through the middle of the home and it passes through the lid of the attic and then it goes to the outdoors. And that spot where it passes through the lid right at the, uh, right at the bottom of the attic floor, if that's not completely airtight, you're going to have air leaking up through that cavity into the attic space. And this is the most obvious one that I can find because you always have that pipe coming right up through. And anytime I'm doing a home inspection on a home where I have any concerns about attic air leaks, which is pretty much a house, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned about all of them, I'll go to that vent and I'll pull the insulation away and I'll check to see if I can look down into a cavity. If I can, that's an attic bypass. We have a problem there. You have warm air leaking into the attic. It needs to be fixed. Here's another example of one. Same thing. This is, this is a vent passing up through the basement into the attic. And you can see all the insulation here. It used to be yellow and pink, and now we got a whole lot of black and darkened insulation that is not mold growing on the insulation. That is dust and dirt. That is 30 years worth of dust accumulated on that insulation because what's, well, what, what's a furnace filter? It's fiberglass. What's the insulation? My photo fiberglass. All this attic insulation is doing is acting like a filter. It's trapping all the dust and dirt in the air. Most of the time when you end up seeing blackened fiberglass insulation, it's not the result of mold. It's actually telling you that there's air leaking through there and the filter and the insulation is just acting like a filter. Next we've got another big bypass here. This is me looking down into the interior walls. Interior walls are never insulated. They're not supposed to be insulated, but we need to do air sealing at the top. Can't let that air leak up into the attic space. And even if those walls are air sealed, you don't have air leaking through the drywall into the wall cavity, you're still going to have convective heat loops. Convection is still gonna bring warm air up into the attic space. There's another look of a similar situation looking up from a, this is a bathtub access panel. Whole house fans are notorious for attic air leaks. Those are, those are really bad. We don't have a ton of those here in Minnesota, but when we do, they leak a lot of air. They got these little shutters that are impossible to get air sealed properly. This is what they look like from the attic side. When you got all this light spilling up into the attic space, you're certainly gonna have a lot of air leaking up into the attic space as well. Chimney chaseways are notorious for attic air leaks. This is a chimney chaseway where they'd kind of put the insulation up against the edge of the chimney, but I'll tell you what, that, that insulation, fiberglass insulation, it acts like a filter. It allows air to pass through. It is not an air barrier. Here's an example of where new construction meets old. We had a nice half inch to three quarter inch gap all along the intersection of the new versus old construction. Here's a place where we've got all these wires poking through these tiny little drill holes at the top plates of the walls. Those are attic air leaks. I know they, they're small, they seem inconsequential. It's like, well, how much air could really be leaking through there? A lot. Uh, I don't get lucky and just start digging through attic spaces, kind of pulling away the insulation to find these. I use an infrared camera and using that, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, it's so easy to find these air leaks. I point around in the attic and look for hot spots. When I find them, I pull the insulation away and boom, there we are. It's tiny little holes are, are obvious through a foot of insulation. These equate to a lot of air leaking through the attic space. Here's another example of one. Plumbing vents passing through the lower spaces up through the attic space. Unless somebody took the time to air seal them, they're going to leak air. So I've been showing you all these examples of, of air leaks. What do we do to fix all of this stuff? What, what's the solution? You hire an insulation contractor to come out and take care of it and they're gonna air seal it. For the really small areas, they're probably gonna use caulking. They may use spray foam. Spray foam is the easiest way to do it. it, it you typically use closed cell spray foam. They, they, the most thorough way to take care of this is to pull away all of the insulation on like half of the attic space. Take the spray foam gun and just spray foam the entire lid. Hit everything, hit the top plates of walls, 
hit all of those places where pipes come through or wires come through. Just seal the whole thing up all at once. Take all that insulation, push it to the other side of the attic, and repeat. And then when it's all done, top off the R value of the insulation to today's standards. In Minnesota, we're at R49 for attics. And you know, bring it up to at least R49. Most, most contractors are just gonna go to R60 to be safe. Make sure they cover the whole thing. That's, that's the typical fix. And a project like that, you know, I'm not here to quote prices, but most insulation contractors are gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of two to four dollars per square foot to do that type of work in an attic. And oh, and the, the one little exception there, I showed furnace vents, you can't take, sp you can't take spray foam and just put it right around a, a high temperature furnace vent. You actually need to have sheet metal. So you would take sheet metal, fashion it to form a nice tight seal around there as, as best you can, and then they take high temperature caulk, and then they build a, a one inch shield around it, and then they'd insulate up against that. So I don't know, I'm getting into the nitty gritty details, but this is what an insulation contractor would know. Side note, if you're hiring an insulation contractor to come out and add insulation to your attic, it is now law in Minnesota that they must perform air sealing before they insulate. That's law. The Minnesota Department of Commerce says insulation contractors must do this. So that's how important it is for all this air sealing to happen. So that's, that's the number one driver behind ice dams is attic bypasses. Oh, and then what if you have bath fans venting into an attic space? Uh, just like this? This is bad news. Now, I don't even call this an attic bypass. I'd call this like maybe a powered bypass. We're taking the really warm, really moist air in a home in a bathroom or a kitchen and we're just pumping it into the attic space. If all these little leaks are bad news, uh, taking a fan and pumping it in there is really bad news. So where does insulation fall into this? It, insulation does matter and there's three things that can go wrong with insulation. You can have missing insulation, inadequate insulation, or the wrong type. And the wrong type falls into kind of a gray area but I feel it's worth mentioning. So first, let's talk about missing insulation. Uh, this is, well, there's two ways it can happen. Number one, somebody just plain forgot to insulate a space. I've found that on a number of new construction homes where they forgot spaces. I've never found an entire home uninsulated, but I have found homes where you have two attic spaces and one of the attic spaces gets completely forgotten about. Seen that happen a number of times. There, a lot of the time, insulation will just fall down. This is a knee wall space in an attic where the insulation was falling out of place. Here's a cavity where they completely forgot to insulate. Inadequate insulation is another concern. If you don't have enough physical room for insulation at the eaves, you might not have enough. Now, in new homes that we build today in Minnesota, we have something called an energy heel truss, where at the very edge of the roof, they build the truss up by like, you know, a foot, two feet, you have a lot of room there just so you can have a lot of insulation at those outer wall areas. That's, that's great, but on older construction you don't have enough physical room for that. So you end up with stuff like this where you have the roof sheathing coming down and almost touching the top plate of the outside wall. This doesn't give enough room for insulation at the eaves. Here's another example of that. This is an attic where we had two insulation jobs over the years. The first time they did it, there was just, you know, like five inches of that pink stuff. Then another contractor came in and added a bunch of yellow insulation on top of that, but they didn't improve anything at the eaves because there just wasn't room. And this house had some major ice dam issues. If you have a savvy insulation contractor, what they can do is get in at those eaves, pull all that insulation away, and then spray foam it. They'd use closed cell spray foam insulation to really beef up the R value at the eaves and then fill in the areas, fill in the areas back with loose fill traditional insulation as best they can. Next would be improper insulation. Now this is kind of a gray area. I mean it's tough for me to say that a specific type of insulation is just downright improper, but I really do feel that way about fiberglass bats. Uh, the, the stuff that comes in a roll that homeowners purchase at the store and bring in their attic and unroll and, and you know, get the job done. I don't know if I've ever seen that stuff properly installed in an attic. Unless that stuff is perfectly installed, you're going to end up with a lot of heat loss. And I'm talking exponential levels of heat loss. Here's some 
different images. We've got fiberglass bats in this attic here. You can see with my infrared camera overlay that in the places where the bats didn't perfectly touch, we have a lot of heat coming through there. It's impossible to get these things to fit around obstructions like uh, recess lights. Here's just a bunch more gaps. It, it's really tough to get this stuff to be installed properly. And the reason nobody uses this in new construction today is because fiberglass bats cost about twice as much as loose fill insulation. It's far more labor intensive to do it and it's impossible to do it right. So if you've got fiberglass bats in an attic and you have ice dams, well, the, those two are very closely related. So what do, you, what do you do if you have fiberglass bats? You got a couple options. One would be to hire an insulation contractor to remove all of it, air seal the attic lid, and then re-insulate with loose fill insulation. Another would be to push it all to the side, air seal, put it all back, and then use loose fill on top of it. And a third option, which I, I think would kind of be the least desirable option, but it is an option, is you hire a company to simply blow a bunch of loose fill insulation on top of that. That's gonna beef up your R value, but it's not gonna do anything to fix your attic air leaks. So it's an option. I'm not a huge fan of that option though. So what about ventilation? It, you know, the whole theory with roof vents is that you're going to have air coming into the attic at the soffits and then it's going to pass through the attic space. It's going to leave up high and if it's zero degrees outside, all that air is going to pass through the attic and it's going to keep the attic at zero degrees and the roof decking is going to stay cold and you're never going to have ice dams form. So you want tons of ventilation. That's going to fix everything. Well, I found in reality it just doesn't work that way. And I, that's, that's from having done dozens, probably hundreds of ice dam inspections. Inspections just to get to the root cause of ice dams. And I found very little correlation between attic ventilation and ice dams. I found wicked ice dams on houses that have tons of ventilation. And I've found no ice dams on a lot of homes that had very poor ventilation. The two simply don't have a lot to do with each other. And don't, don't just take my word for it. Here's some text from the Minnesota Department of Commerce. And the University of Minnesota has some information on that as well. And, they, and all, the, all the big building science people out there will tell you the same thing. They'll tell you if ventilation is needed, it's not the solution to attic, uh, attic problems. So what do you do if you have a one and a half story home? How do you fix that? I've got bad news for you. You can't fix it. Those things are just impossible to fix. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm, I'm kind of making a joke a little bit here. They can be fixed, but the big challenge is the slant wall. It's the part between the knee wall and the true attic space above. Typically, you're going to have two by four construction. And so you end up with a cavity that, well, it's going to be about three and a half to four inches. Usually not four. Usually it's just three and a half inches there. And you got to figure out what's going to go there. Are we going to have just ventilation and no insulation? Are we going to pack it full of insulation and not have it vented? Or are we going to have some of each? Maybe have the code required one inch of ventilation and then two and a half inches of insulation. Whatever it is, I promise you it's not going to be enough to prevent ice dams. I've seen it attempted. It simply doesn't work. Even if somebody takes that whole attic space and they fill up the entire cavity with spray foam insulation, every one of those rafters is gonna have so much thermal bridging that you're gonna end up with melted snow at the roof and you're still gonna have ice dams. I'm not a huge fan of one and a half story homes. They're difficult to fix. There's two ways you can fix them. Either you can gut them from the inside where you build down, then you lose some headroom and you, you add a lot more room for traditional insulation and maybe even add a vented space right underneath the roof sheathing. That's one way of dealing with it. The other, and this would, believe it or not, it's actually the less costly method, is to tear the roof off and build up from there, build, basically build a second roof on top of that, have a bunch of insulation below it, have a vented space, and then you have your roof decking. That will fix ice dams on one and a half story homes, but that's 
surely going to be a, a five-figure project. It's a lot of money to do it. So it can be done. It's just it's really expensive. So when we're doing home inspections for people who buy one and a half story homes, we tell them you're probably going to have ice dams just like all of the other neighbors on your street. They, they probably all have ice dams too and you're going to want to do the same thing that you see all of your neighbors doing in the winter. Get yourself a roof rake and pull the snow off the roof. That's, that's about it. If there's no snow, you're not going to have ice dams. Snow is the fuel for ice dams. Get rid of the snow, problems are fixed. So that's, that's one and a half story homes. And that advice covers other styles of homes too. However, sometimes you have homes where it's just not even practical to get out there with a roof rake and pull that snow off because, well, sometimes it's going to be a, a two story or two and a half story home and you can't reach it. Sometimes the roofs are so close to each other that there's no way you can get there with a, with a roof rake. In those cases, you know, if you, if you can't fix it the right way with insulation and air sealing, uh, let's say it's, you know, it's completely finished off, you have cathedral ceiling, something like that, and you, it's not in the budget to tear everything out and get at it and fix it the right way. There are some other ways that you can prevent ice dams. I hate saying this because it's, it's probably the least desirable way of dealing with it, but heat cables are effective. I, there have been many times where I've recommended heat cables. It's always my last option, but they do work. Now in the pictures, you know, the manufacturers make them look super pretty. It's like, you know, I, I like to think of the Big Mac uh, billboards that you see where the, it looks just nice and perfect and delicious and then you get it in real life and it's like this smushy mess. That's kind of how heat cables work. The manufacturers on the box, they make it look so perfect and pretty and then in reality, this is what you end up seeing. So the bottom line is heat cables do work, but they need to be installed properly. This is a good image of heat cables that were not installed properly. They just kind of looped them about a foot up the edge of the roof. For those to be effective, to prevent leaks from ice dams, you need to loop those heat cables back and forth past the exterior wall line. I think the manufacturers say you need to go at least one foot past the exterior wall line, and then you need to go 12 feet up the valleys, and you need to go in the gutters, the downspouts and the downspout extensions to provide a pathway from, for water all the way back to the ground. So while, while you may have a little 15 foot section of roof, that could easily turn into a 60 foot heating cable. So it's, it's not cheap, but it is effective. So now what do you do if you already have ice dams and you want to get rid of them? Well, the only method that I would ever recommend is hiring a professional to come out and steam the ice dams off. That's what this guy is doing. This is a cool nighttime shot. And when I say steam, I mean steam. I don't mean use a high temperature pressure washer. There's a lot of companies out there that do that. They call it steam. It's not truly steam. There's a big difference. The guys who will, or the companies who will come out and use a high temp pressure washer are gonna do some serious damage to your roof. Now, here's a quick video of what it looks like to have steam removal on an ice dam. You notice this guy is using a steamer. If you, you probably can't tell in this video, but if you look really carefully at the handle on that wand that he's using, there is no trigger. He can't let go of a trigger and have steam stop coming out of his wand. If there was a trigger and you let go, it would quickly explode because it's steam. It's, it, it's under a lot of pressure. And also notice what he's wearing. He's wearing jeans and a sweatshirt. And look at what's coming off the roof. It's steam. That's it. This is a safe, effective way of removing ice dams. No problem there. So now, let's look at the opposite of that. This is a guy who is using a high temperature pressure washer, and note what he's wearing. He's wearing the, uh, the whole rain getup. He's got the rain boots, the poncho, all that. He's creating an icy mess on the ground, I'm sure. And when he's done, the roof is gonna look something like this. He's gonna, he's gonna hack that roof apart. And what about some other DIY methods for ice dam removal? Well, <laughs> I don't recommend any of these, but I know people do them. I know from the first job, the first real job I ever had was at a hardware store. And I remember every year where there was a lot of snow, people would flood that hardware store asking for pantyhose and salt. And they'd want to fill up the pantyhose with salt and throw it on their roof. And the idea is it's going to create these melt channels in the ice dam and water's going to drain out and you're not going to have water leaking into your house. 
So people do that. I think it's a little crazy. I'd say if you're going to do something as crazy as that, why not just take the salt and pour it right on the ice dam, right on your roof? I'll tell you, I, I used to live in Minneapolis and I had a neighbor let me do all these different tests on his roof to see how they all work. And I, I tried those salt filled pantyhose and check it out. This is, this is what it looked like after uh, a couple hours with the salt filled pantyhose. No effect whatsoever, but I, I poured salt on his roof too. And that, that quickly ate, uh, ate a nice little channel through the ice dam. So it, it, it depends on temperature. An axe is a great way to put huge holes in your roof really quickly and probably kill yourself while you're on an icy ladder. I wouldn't recommend doing it. An ice pick is a good way to put small holes in your roof real quickly and pierce yourself while you're up on an icy ladder. I don't recommend doing that either. But again, people do it. These roof melt tablets, uh, despite the name, they don't actually melt your roof. The idea is that these tablets are supposed to melt holes in the ice dam and then make nice little channels for water to drain out of. And on the package it says, toss one tablet for every square foot of problem area or whatever. And they show on the picture it's all nice and perfect. Um, I've got excellent tablet tossing skills and I'm not able to toss them like they show in that photo. I mean, I, I tossed them on to my neighbors and this is how they all turned out, kind of haphazard and whatever. I, I got up on there and I placed them all super carefully so they look like the photo. And here's what it looked like after they melted. <laughs> the ice dam is still there. They melt holes in the ice dam. And then once the water refreezes overnight and you get more melting, the salt just kind of disappears and you're left with an ice dam again. So I don't know, I'm not a huge fan of these salt tablets either. And that, that's, that's applying salt directly to your roof. Why not just pour it out of a bag? I don't know. Okay, those are all the non-recommended methods for removing ice dams. And I think that, that sums up my ice dam spiel. That's all I have to say on the matter. The, the bottom line is that ice dams are typically caused by attic bypasses. Sometimes it's insufficient insulation. If you want to have it fixed, you hire a good insulation contractor to come out and take care of both of those things at the same time. If you have a really challenging attic space where you just can't get an insulation contractor out there because there's, there's nowhere to work or you have a one and a half story home, then it's really about ice dam prevention. Remove the snow, install heat cables if you have to. That's it. All right, thanks for watching, appreciate it.